directed towards towards sustainable development. Um, and uh, and I've been doing these meetings with um, Lisa now for a year or so, and uh, and value the connection. Um, so shall I pass it on round the round the room? Edith, you are you next on my screen anyway? Yes, go ahead, Edith. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Edith Luhanga. I am from Tanzania, but I'm working in Rwanda right now at the Carnegie Mellon University, Africa. So Ganesh is my colleague, and that's how I joined here. Um, my area of focus in terms of research is in digital health, and I particularly work on solutions that are for people to use rather than clinical solutions. And um, looking to make those open source and for behavior change. Thank you. Okay, I'm Rita Lutra. I think we skipped over uh, because of the two or three new people here. Um, uh, I've been working with the United Nations for all my life, most of my life, it's inherited from my family. Anyway, so uh, I retired from clinical practice in 2015. So now full-time, I'm working for the UN and WHO. In 2013, UN has allowed uh, this uh, virtual side events. What will happen next year? I don't know. I will let you know. But if we have to travel to the UN headquarters uh, in New York, I can always write good enough that I get uh, side events. But whether we have to tra travel to New York, the UN headquarters or not, we will know. CPD is our second for the season. There is a STI, Science and Technology, which is in May. Then ra last one, which is in July, and Roger and I, and we all look forward to it, is a high-level political forum. This is the highest level NGOs can participate at the United Nations. After that is the General Assembly in September. That's how these sessions run. Those of you who have recently joined uh, us, this group, uh, I know these acronyms, but we all grew up in the world of a science and technology. We are used to the acronyms. So let's stick to the CPD, which stands for Commission for Population and uh, Development. That's all we are discussing. And its uh, side event is on April 13th for us, early in the morning for us, but uh, oh, Colleen is too early. Okay, so now I'll hand over to Edith is already done. Uh, go ahead, Ganesh, you are the next one. Hello, Ganesh. We lost you. You're on mute, I think. Oh, he's, he muted. Why? My wing. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Um, okay. uh, I was uh, looking at some things in the <laughs> other tab. I'll try not to do that on the uh, 13th. No, I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, um, Ganesh um, and Serena's dad. Um, I do a few different things out of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. And Edith was being very modest. She's one of the rising stars of Africa. So I look forward to her uh, maybe one day becoming... Uh, um, president of Tanzania, is it, uh, Edith? Is that uh, is that something you're aspiring for? So uh, we need more uh, women leaders there. Uh, so uh, lovely to be a part of this group. Rita, happy to help uh, as much as I can. I have uh, a good uh, collaboration um, in Roger. Uh, we don't collaborate very much in uh, family circles, so this is good to be uh, involved with true collaborators. Okay. Okay, Colleen, you are next. Okay, Colleen Kraft. I am a professor of pediatrics at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. And my major role there, um, working at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, is running a resident uh, track in their education on advocacy. And so within that, we do community health, global health, and, and quality improvement. And I have, have done work in Ghana and South Africa um, and India and work with my residents to put together 
projects, policies. I have several residents who are very interested in policy, and they have been invited to do some participation with this group here. Um, so, so I have lots of resident mentees. I have 57 residents in my track. And so we have lots of people who are very interested in working on different areas. Um, and, and they really are kind of the go-tos for some of the preliminary research and some of the initial writing. And then I work with them through the process to, to just be a part of what we all do. That's a lot of residents, Colleen. I didn't know your program was so big. Goodness me. We have you know? 108 residents. The 57 are the are just in my track. Wow. So, <laughs> over three years' time. So yeah, it's a, a lot of residents. So uh Serena actually knows one of them. So um, she had told me about that. So so yeah. Nice. Yes. Nice. Nice. Yeah, Wonderful. Well, Serena, you, you go ahead, because like I tell you, you are formally not written for CPD because of the lack of the time. But if any of the speakers couldn't connect, yes, you are in. You can uh, definitely uh, tell a few words about the population and the development. Uh, so pre prepare a little discussion for you So and go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Serena. I'm Ganesha's daughter. Hi, Dad. Um, I am at Hopkins right now um, in public health. I am uh, interested in mostly pediatric mental health and then intimate partner violence, uh, doing some research on intimate partner violence in India. Uh, my current research for my capstone centers around uh, incarceration rates and how that impacts uh, pediatric mental health in California, actually, so sort of have both a domestic and international focus. Um, and hopefully I'll be presenting on May 3rd um, regarding some of those topics surrounding adolescent mental health and sexual and reproductive health, which is also a space that I work in. Um, and it's really lovely to meet you all. Yeah. Did I cover all the major, <laughs> major things? Yes, yes, you I'll did. just be a fly on the wall for this call. I'm just here to learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had the chance to meet Lubna in Turkey. We have another young pediatrician, um, goes to Khan, who has worked with us on some of these. And she cannot be on this next one, but uh, she introduced me to Lubna. And we actually just met in Istanbul a couple of weeks ago. And her background is absolutely lovely. And so I'm going to let you tell the rest, Lubna. I'm originally from Syria. However, I'm living. I graduated from Turkey, and I'm currently living in uh, Istanbul and working here in the pediatrics department. Uh -huh. uh, just like uh, Colleen said, I'm here to cover for my friend Gaste, and maybe I'll give another point of view uh, about the topics we are talking about. Um, Oh, it's great to see you, Lodna, and uh, you know, really yeah. pleased to step in for Kirsten. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. great to have you here in this group. I thought your slides were great, so uh, so we yeah, got absolutely. you know our building blocks for this presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. So I think Donna is having a problem in connecting. God only knows what the problem is. But anyway, so let's get it started. So I will do the introduction. Every only thing which I have already sent, everybody approves. I the little introduction I wrote about all of you, and uh, because I want to keep keep it short and sweet and uh, go through the fast. Okay, uh, Doctor Anshu Energy won't be joining from uh, WHO. Uh, there is another. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, there is a, 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 another doctor from WHO will be joining us. Her name is Dr. Valentina Beltag. And she has sent me her introduction. I will read it. But main thing is her specialization is quality sexual health and uh, adolescent health. So that will be, oh, wow. See, uh, it's good to have a good wingman. Uh, he put it up with no problems at all. I would have lost you a few times. Anyway, so after that, I will read the WHEC statement and the slides. Uh, uh, can you put it up, Ganesh, uh, uh, the slides presentation, which I have sent it to you? All right. Yeah, here it is. And maybe you can run it in a... All right, thank you very much. 
the Women's Health and Education Center was established in 2001 to undertake projects and programs with the United Nations, WHO, and UNESCO. At the heart and soul of mission of WHECR, Sustainable Developmental Goals, SD, SDGs, 3, 4, 5, and quality education is the single most investment that any country can make for its future and for its people. Investing in education is investing in people and our collective future. This is a moral, political, and economic imperative. Next purpose. Purpose of this side event is to discuss sound policies and planning, as well as efficient implementation arrangements to achieve our common agenda. Second, to generate discussion and action on the role of education, knowledge, and learning in view of the predicted possible and preferred future of humanity and the planet. Understanding education and health and affordable education and health are human rights. Next, our purpose and our vision, knowledge and learning are humanity's greatest renewable resources for responding to challenges and inventing alternatives. Quality education does more than respond to a challenging world. WHEC's recommendations and areas for development are next. Next. Okay. Oh, th that's a little complicated slide, but these are the four different areas we focused on. First, inclusion and equity uh, in through health and education. Secondly, to deliver quality education, adequate resources, and reliable financing are essential. Third, lifelong learning opportunities. In medicine, we call it continuing medical education. Our advocacy and global health line is serving in 227 countries and territories and is linked with well-respected schools, colleges, and universities in both developing countries and developed countries. We serve about 12 million subscribers every year. Fourth, access, which is very important. WHC has a special focus on disseminating evidence-based information to the least developed countries. Yes, we give our education programs free to the 50 least developed countries identified by UNDP, United Nations Development Program. Please review it at your convenience. These slides and these projects are already on the website womenshealthsection.com. We had uh, uh, done this uh, e-learning, e-health, and e-government initiative in 2022 high-level political oh, forum. Is the audio on? Oh, yes. Okay, Donna, ready. finally, Donna has joined. Okay, uh, next one. Uh, uh, importance. Uh, this NGO, WHEC, collaborates with United Nations and UN system, especially WHO and UNESCO. Our collective approach, looking forward vision is what quality education can do. Relevance, we aim to mobilize humanity's collective intelligence that involves youth, educators, civil society, governments, and stakeholders. Significance of this is uh, there is a rich diversity of ways on knowing, which realizes on a broad and open process. Education reforms world. Next. Learning life lessons series. In 2021, uh, WHEC had launched this new initiative. These so-called life lessons include decision-making, problem-solving, critical thinking, self-esteem, communication, 
self-assessment, and coping strategies. People with such skills are more likely to adopt a healthy lifestyles. Each new generation of children faces challenges, but those being dealt with today's youth seem particularly daunting. Next. Tools for child development. These tools for child development are helping students and teachers and supporting them in their quest to make their lives better. The healthy future of society depends on the literacy and the health of today's children who are the guardians of the future. We encourage institutions to use this resource to increase engagement, improving learning and good mental health. Next. Our projects and programs are helping schools to plan and develop health promoting schools programs for youth development, mental health programs, and preventing gender and gun violence and help them with the skills to handle life's challenges for good mental health. Next, harnessing the digital revolution for the benefit of public education. If harnessed properly, the digital revolution can be one of the most powerful tools for ensuring quality education for all and transform the way teachers teach and the learners learn. If not governed properly, it could increase in inequalities and undermine lean, uh, learning outcomes as the recent pandemic made us too clear. I will leave this uh, important topic here and two of my wonderful colleagues, Dr. Ganesh Mani and uh, Dr. Edith Lubna have joined they are the technical experts in this area, and they'll expand it further. Thank you very much. We welcome all. Before we go any further, let me introduce my dear friend, Donna Jenny, whose computer has started to work finally. And uh, uh, Donna, uh, that's Roger, you already know. Edith is from Rwanda. Ganesh is from uh, Pittsburgh, and Lubna is from Turkey. Colleen, you already know. Serena is from Johns Hopkins. So uh, here you are. I will be happy to hand over it to Dr. Valentina Beltag from WHO. Well, she is not here today with us, but after that, Dr. Ganesh Mani, go ahead. We would love to see your slides, or if you want to. Yeah, we don't have slides yet, but maybe since Donna just joined, Donna, do you want to introduce yourself for uh, 30 seconds? Oh, yeah. sure. I would be happy to. And it's my privilege to meet you all and Roger to see you again. A wonderful opportunity. And we thank Dr. Luther for providing this forum for us to share our ideas about health promoting schools and improving global partnerships in health and education. I have a PhD in clinical psychology. I've worked in private practice for agencies and for the Springfield Public Schools for um, many, many years. And one of the things that I've done for my topic is to reimagine public schools in America with a case study for Springfield, Massachusetts. And Massachusetts is one of the forerunners in the United States for improving education and having some of the highest high school graduation rates in the country. So thank you, Roger. See you, Donna. Welcome, Donna. Um, so we don't, I think Edith and I don't have a presentation today. Um, as mm -hmm. I said, I'm more of an AI and data expert. Uh, I teach a class uh, around AI grand challenges uh, for CMU Africa and actually the uh, global CMU campuses. I've had students from um, Doha, Qatar, as well as the main campus, Pittsburgh. So there will be some content from uh, there I'm going to... Uh, reuse for this presentation and um, we'll um, coordinate and put some things uh, together around uh, uh, K-12 education, um, AI data and uh, experiential learning that should be uh, experiential. And I think um, Edith was going to talk about uh, uh, digital public goods um, 
or catalyzing transformation in education and health. Uh, do you want to um, say some things or do you want to bring up a couple of slides from a previous presentation or anything like that? Whatever you want to do. I sure. Think. Um, I think I'll just speak on it just because the slides are not quite ready yet. Um, so digital public goods, uh, things like open data, open AI, open source um, software uh, are really important. And we've seen it, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, because some of the tools that were used to control the spread of the pandemic were all recognized digital public goods. So we have Vivoc, for example, which was uh, used to issue vaccine certifications in five countries. Over 2 billion certifications uh, were issued. But we also have DHIS2, which is the primary um, health information system used here in Africa. Uh, and that was rapidly adapted during the COVID-19 pandemic to manage surveillance for COVID-19, and in some cases, even issuing of um, vaccination certificates. So. The open source movement is really important just because it um, allows countries to quickly innovate and fully customize solutions without vendor restrictions. And this can really change the landscape in terms of how many apps are available for healthcare and education. But uh, the key things I would probably focus on in the presentation is the calls to action of what can we do to really make this um, move towards digital public goods uh, bigger and more scalable. So. Uh, one thing to understand is that obviously with open source tools, you have so many people developing these tools. Uh, you have a wide variety of skill, a wide variety of understanding of different programming languages and standards, and this can vastly affect uh, what types of solutions we have. So currently, for example, in Africa, there's more than um, more than a, a million, I believe. Sorry, I don't have the statistic. Uh, there's so many uh, e-health solutions that don't all work together. And what we're really meaning is that different parts of the health system are having to use solutions that they can't integrate to provide a continuum of care for people. Uh, and so one patient in one hospital will be treated using a different information system than in a different hospital. And that's, we're not even using the wealth of data available in apps. So one key area for intervention when it comes to really scaling up digital public goods is really strengthening the skills in terms of how to inter create software that's interoperable and how to manage systems integration. And these are things we really need to be looking at from the education sector when we're training these developers who are going to one day develop these digital public goods. But another thing we have to look into is when we talk about open AI models, one open ma massive um, AI model that's been in the news recently is ChatGPT. And one of the challenges we're hearing about this is that because it was trained on data and human data can be flawed, it can be biased, um, chances are it does give biased answers to different questions. Now, as we're moving more to things like Search 3.0, which is all about search engines not just giving you a curated list of information, but being more conversational and actually giving you responses, uh, we also need to be making sure the people who are creating these models and reusing these models are aware of how to identify biases in their data set, but also biases in the performance of the model. And this is another key area of intervention for higher education. So my talk would center around these key points. Wonderful. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Edith mentioned uh, open AI. It's ironic that uh, it's not open uh, anymore. It reminds me of the uh, Ministry of Peace uh, moniker from uh, 1984. Um, over to you, um, Colleen. Edith, by the way, that was wonderful. It was really interesting. Given that it wasn't a presentation, uh, it was really, really informative. And uh, it's terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we were going to be, um, Roger and Lubna and I, I know we were going to be talking a little bit about education and health promoting schools and, and really along that topic there. And when Lubna and I talked, we talked a little bit about, about what accessing education is like in her part of the world from Syria to Turkey. And then I was going to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that that I was involved in in Ghana as, as kind of a... Um, you know, a comparison to what's been done, what still needs to be done, particularly with the with the aspect of um, of girls and girls' education in uh, developing countries. So I can go through my slides if you'd like, or if you want, if you want to try to do this where we have that Roger and then Lubna and then me. Um, I think it would flow a little bit better. Okay. 
Yeah. So do you want me to run my slides and Rachel? Yeah, go ahead. And then and then and then um I can okay. get a little bit to share yours and then I'll share mine. Okay. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay, there we go. Um yeah. so I'm I want to uh, in this uh, brief uh, session I want to talk about sustainable development in, in the context of educational reform and looking behind some of the rhetoric. Um so uh, in terms of the Sustainable Development Goals, um, the focus here is on SDG 4, uh, as we've already heard from, from Rita, uh, in particular the, the target number 4.3 um, about ensuring equal access for women and men, affordable and quality, technical, vocational, tertiary education, etc. So my focus is really on, on higher education here. Now, um, I must preface my remarks by acknowledging the work that has already been done by UNESCO. They've got a very large initiative that has been going on for some time. They published their roadmap last year, which is an important document. Um, and it addresses uh, issues like climate change, income inequality, and the other things that I've listed on this, this slide. Um, so that is significant. And at their education conference this year, um, it was the, the discussion had moved on. Um, in terms of going beyond the map into, uh, into the realms of implementation and putting principles into practice. Um, and, um, and I hope these slides will be available through WHEC um, because it's worth following this link um, and the other publication that came out this year is on knowledge driven actions, which is full of uh, practical information uh, based on the, the previous research. Um, and one of the recurring themes throughout all this work is about integrity and ethics, um, because my contention is if these are not properly addressed, it will hinder the successful implementation of these reforms. Um, and you see my closing remark on this slide is that business as usual in terms of higher ed is simply not an option. Um, the sector as a whole um, really needs uh, is in need of fairly urgent reform. Now, in terms of social responsibility, um, you know, within the context of, of the reform of, of higher ed, um, universities need to have sustainable policies and practices. And it's not just about climate change and reducing carbon footprints. That's an important part of it, but it's not the whole thing. A lot of it has to do with universities and their role in society. And the fact that in order to be sustainable, um, they ought to be representing or providing a benefit rather to the whole community, not just to an intellectual elite. Now, part of the thing, one, one thing that will help to make that happen is to uh, develop a system for, of rewards uh, for scholars, academics who do practical research, because at the moment, a lot of institutions uh, tend to ignore such things um, in terms of financial rewards, promotions, um, and so forth, and, um, and rankings, ratings and rankings of universities. Um, so for sustainable development to be um, a reality, uh, we must uh, at least reward the people that are doing research on it, and where that research is, is directed towards a tangible public good rather than just some theoretical part of, of discussion. Um, and something that is absolutely fundamental is the need for institutions to cooperate and collaborate on sustainability. Um, rather than just constantly pushing the competitive elements, which tends to be perpetuated by the ranking systems. And coincidentally, I saw a piece in the New York Times today about uh, one of the big US ranking systems that is uh, beginning to fall apart because some of the big players have, have dropped out. So um, this is quite a live topic. I'm also on a task force um, uh, with the Higher Education Sustainability Initiative looking into these issues. But that's I won't go into that today. So in terms of ethics, sustainability and higher ed. Um, these are some of the things that I think need to be looked at. Um, access, you know, who has got access to higher ed, particularly in low middle income countries? Um, and how is that funded? Is the system for funding equitable? Um, is the distinction between um, private and, and state run, uh, but even within state universities, um, is there's still, a, somebody has to fund it, uh, there is a cost, um, then there's the question of the gender balance, both within the student population and within the faculty, and that means faculty right there up to senior faculty. Um, so, um, and it's worth asking the questions, what benefits can potentially be enjoyed from accessing higher ed? Um, in other words, it, does it 
what is the record in terms of leading towards you know good meaningful employment um and then what we've already touched on is is um the question of uh AI um, and learning technologies. And I just wanted to flag up here that there are ethical issues that need to be addressed. Um, Edith already sort of hinted at it um, when she was talking about uh, digital public goods, um, but the question of, of who owns it and who takes moral responsibility, who are the moral agents behind these technologies? Um, because uh, technology itself may be morally neutral, but the people that, that write it and the people that use it are the ones that, that have moral agency. Um, so these things need debating. I mean, this would be a topic for a whole workshop. Um, but UNESCO has already done a, a lot of background work on this, but I think there's still more work to do. So in terms of finding answers, um, in my research on sustainable development, equity or fairness is a fundamental principle. I think it underlies all 17 SDGs. So I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and in terms of the ethics of reform in higher ed, um, I, I do a lot of work with clinicians um, on um, ethical decision-making. Um, and I often say to them um, that it's about asking the right questions at the right time. And the same applies in, in this context. Um, and I maintain that if you take the ethical considerations into account, it should help uh, the process of finding workable, sustainable solutions in higher ed. Um, and finally, this moving forward with this, this point about practical research, um, there's clearly a place in, in all higher ed institutions for philosophical debate around ethics and morality, um, but there's a place for applied ethics, whether it's in terms of healthcare um, or academic programs, courses, um, and even institutional policies. Um, and if these take into account the ethical implications of those policies, it should help motivate staff, inspire students, and reach out into the community. Thank you. Uh, who's, okay. uh, Rita, are you oh. coming next? Or do we want to get Lubna to, come, to go next? Okay. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm sharing my presentation. Well, Roger, it was fantastic. Oh, thank you, Rita. It's very kind. And we wanted to, to make it so that we have kind of Roger with that overview, and then Lubin and I are kind of going to get down, down to brass tacks to talk about different areas of the world and how these principles are being met and where the gap still is. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that sounds good. It makes, makes sense to do it in that order. Um, well, so I, I don't know whether folks uh, need to leave at the top of the hour. I just want to do a, a time check. So uh, Lubna, Colleen, and... Um, um, Donna, if you want to, you don't have to go through uh, in sort of real time. If you want to sort of summarize and flip through the slides, that would be fine as well, whatever you want to do. But that's fine. I have to leave at the top of the hour too. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah it, mine's, it's like five minutes max. Uh, so, I'll speak about the educational services provided to, uh, to refugees here in Turkey. Uh, we already mentioned this. So what rights to education do refugees have in uh, Turkey? Actually, they, all refugees and asylum seekers have the right to education and may enroll in Turkish schools. Uh, they only need a foreign identification number and they need to have an address. Uh, and there's no there's no need to for them to have any special exam, enrollment exam, or they don't need to speak Turkish and they can't deny access according to that. Uh, adults as well can be. Hey, hey Lumna, you may want to fix one typo. I think the first stand roll needs a second L. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. I told you I was on a trading desk. <laughs> <laughs> so, adults can also benefit from free language uh, uh, and skills training courses, both provided from the Ministry of National Education and uh, by several NGOs. Uh, however, this does not always mean getting uh, quality education. So the some like the several studies have been uh, done here in uh, Turkey, and they looked at the barriers to education among refugees, and they found that there are several barriers. First, being psychological and uh, adaptation uh, most and most of impro importantly language and communication some systematic according to schools and 
training provided to the teachers, how they'll adjust, how will they teach uh, the refugees and family barriers, including financial problems. Uh, in my original presentation, I will, I'm going to go into more details into each one of them. And lastly, if we if we broke down the barriers into two, first being uh, the language problems or language barrier, and the second being the systematic uh, suggestions can be according to that. Uh, first of all, refugee parents should be informed about the education system, what is actually provided, what exams they need to uh, enroll their children in, and so what. And they're also uh, encouraged to acquire basic language skills in order to communicate with their teachers and headmasters. And then looking at the systematic problems, there, there is this bias uh, that's unfortunately based, uh, faced by refugee students. Awareness, awareness raising trainings, especially to, to, our, to teachers, uh, talking about inter, intercultural uh, communication skills should be carried out. Um, that's it. Thank you. Very good, Lubna. Excellent work. Thank Continue. You. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. it's, it's, it's I, I went like I was going to speak more about the barriers, but just for the timing, I yes. speak more in the original in the presentation. Okay, that's fine. Go ahead, Colleen. It's a good start. Okay, excellent. Okay, let's see. I'm going to need to have Libna take her yeah, slides and, down uh, yes, before yes, I share okay. my screen. Yes. Okay. Which again is why having this compiled in one uh, one presentation would really be amazing. Yes. So. Uh, so yeah, so so I'm I'm talking here primarily about about Ghana and and what Ghana has done to help help to uh, encourage girls' education and what the barriers still are here. So um, so it's just starting with the the um, the interaction between child marriage and education and this is really a slide that that comes from um comes from unicef looking at uh the number of of girls who are married the dark green is under age 15 and the red is under age 18 um and what that relationship is to education and primary and secondary education you can see a big inverse relationship between the two so what were the educational reforms in Ghana? 1995 was when they came up with the rule that there would be pre-compulsory universal basic education, which meant kindergarten, four to six, primary education, six to 11, junior high school, 12 to 15. And those who completed that basic education certificate exam were able to go on to a secondary school. In 1997, even more importantly, Ghana came out and said, we are going to focus on girls. And we're going to have a girls education unit and this is going to be something that is going to be part of our strategic plan educating the women in our country and then in 2007 they made secondary school free to to the public but there are gender gaps that still exist and if you look at 1993 versus 2014 the gray is the percentage of males receiving no education um, 1993 23 percent of males and 35 percent of females in 2014, it's 9% of males not receiving education, but 19% of females. So actually the, gen the gender gap has risen, even though we have more a higher percentage of Ghanaians who are receiving education. And that in child labor, there is still that gap. Um, school may be free, but uniforms and school supplies are not. And that presents a gap to our poorest uh, Ghanaians. We're going to talk a little bit about infrastructure and men menstrual hygiene management, which is a big reason for girls to drop out of secondary school. And then the whole topic of untrained teachers in a rapidly growing population. And, and so I'm going to move through the rest of the slides pretty quickly, but a little bit about the recommendations based on, on what has been studied in Ghana. Um, 
and let's see, I'll just go back there, that, that the idea of supporting academic scholarship is important, that schools are really working on education to career development, understanding that not everybody is going to go to college and not everybody should go to college, that there are careers that you need a primary education for, and you need a primary education to educate your children and understand the value in your children. There is a big emphasis on early education, childcare, and preschool. And, and we know this in all of our countries that childcare and early education is so expensive that it really is a barrier to women getting an education and, and being part of the workforce. And they recognize that in Ghana as well, too. There's been a big move on teacher training because particularly in the rural areas, once they started the compulsory public education, there were a lot of teachers who were not trained as teachers. And so the quality of that education was really questionable. Many places are doing co-located health service. And some of that is actually having the menstrual health supplies for girls so that they stay in school. Something very basic like that that we don't think of is really important when you're looking at people wanting to go through and do an ed make an education. Um, this is really something that uh, that really um, goes into some of what Edith was talking about, but digital literacy and financial literacy, that those tools are there, but they need to be taught how to use them and you need to be able to afford the devices to help you use them. And then finally, the idea of giving back and community service. If you have been educated and, and the, the country has invested in you, what can you do to give back some of your resources? So these are all the recommendations that are being put into, into the education model for all primary education, secondary school, and a real emphasis on women's education. I'll stop sharing there. That's oh, great. Excellent. Fabulous. Well, excellent. That's, that's wonderful. Donna, uh, go ahead. If you have your presentation or something, go ahead. I do. And, and thanks, Rita. I, I would really like to give it a try along with the um, some of the slides I have just to see how it works today. Good. All right. Does public school education in America need to be reimagined? The Pew Research Center placed the United States as an impre unimpressive 38th out of 71 countries in math and 24 in science. Among the 35 members of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the US ranked 30th in math and 19th in science. Dan Warwick, superintendent of schools in the city of Springfield has a plan for reimagining the Springfield Public Schools in America for 2023. And that plan is called Portrait of a Graduate. He states clearly, we lose at or win at the preschool level. His school district is the first district in the state to make free, universal, pre-kindergarten education for every child of ages three and four in the city of Springfield. At the start of the 22-23 school year, Springfield added 571 new pre-kindergarten students, a 42% increase from the previous year, bringing the number of pre-K students to 1,753. The need for early education has been a popular topic for many years. Educators say its impact on the future is indisputable, and yet making it available to all children has been both slow and laborious, impeded by obstacles. Going all in on pre-kindergarten learning is admirable on every level, but especially needed at a time in America when equity is a priority. Children of all backgrounds, circumstances, and needs will never receive equitable education unless all children can begin the race at the same starting line. With portrait of a graduate in place, the city of Springfield and the state of Massachusetts will retain its well-earned place as a national education leader. This six-year plan begins with the idea of what graduates should know when they graduate from the Springfield Public Schools. It's a lot more than just typical academics and things that a strategic plan would focus on in our world. It's far reaching. We want students to thrive and be productive members of the community. He f f continues to flesh out portrait of a graduate. We built in programs for extended day support services for students in mornings, evenings, Saturdays. We're also offering summer programs for all kids who need extra services every summer. Everyone is getting a free summer school program. 
We're tracking a cohort of pre-kindergarten students who started with us last fall, and we're hoping by the time these students reach third grade, they'll be academically on grade level in reading and math, thus setting them up for success going forward. Most of the research in America in public schools really shows that if children have not mastered math facts and reading by fourth grade, they will always be behind and much, much more likely to drop out of high school. So targeting preschool is really the way to go. Springfield Police Commissioner Cheryl Clapford has the distinction of being a law enforcement officer for the past 44 years and the experience of working in an urban city in America. Her comments on educating our youth in today's society highlight the adage, it takes a village to raise a child. Education is a key component of success and satisfaction in society. Our children cannot possibly learn when they're frightened and stressed. When the thought of getting beat up or harassed in person or online through one of the social media outlets exists, they cannot concentrate when they know they go home, one of their parents is drunk or high. They cannot properly concentrate when they're hungry. They shouldn't have to worry about being beat up on the school bus and not being liked because a gang member has posted unkind pictures on a social media site. Many do not have the support of a family or loved one at home. This is the reality of a child's life in an urban public school in, in America. They don't wanna pick one parent or over another during domestic violence fights at home. Providing proper guidance and a listening concerned adult can make it or break it for many of our school children. The school resource officer can be of great assistance. School employees should be teaming up with resource officers and parents to provide the best possible environment for learning. In cities like Springfield, research has shown that having police officers called school resource officers really ups the chances of children feeling safe in classrooms and being able to concentrate. And it also says that school staff, teachers, other workers, even cafeteria workers, feel safer with a school officer in place in Springfield. Police officers are uh, examples of surviving in life. They survive criticism, hostility, anger, people being assaulted because of mental illness and addiction problems. They're great models for young students or even high school students. There's always a lot of pros and cons to cities deciding to use police officers in school. Um, it's one of the most contested topics in public education, and yet research is really clear. Com Com Commissioner Clapper concludes by stating the obvious connection. We have to concentrate our efforts on making the classroom and school day experience as calming and safe for the students as possible so that they're in a position to learn. How does artificial intelligence play into all this? Robert Bardwell says, hold tight. There's a new digital tool available for students who will no longer have to generate their own papers, assignments, or reports. Meet Chat GPT. Enter the term Romeo and Juliet, a prompt and a word limit, and within seconds, out comes a grammatically correct thesis on said topic. Some consider this new tool to be transformative, while others see it as the enemy. In Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, Queen Ramonda says to her daughter, Sherry, I think one day artificial intelligence is going to kill us all. Last May, a day of exploring AI and how it shapes our lives was held for students across 88 countries, including Springfield, Massachusetts. The day of online artificial intelligence included a series of hands-on classroom activities and an interactive panel kicked off by Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito. May and Dominic Sarno of the city of Springfield states, I wanna commend Superintendent Warwick and his dedicated team for their ongoing efforts. Portrait of a Graduate was a tremendous success. We'll continue to press forward with educational and workforce development initiatives to show that a zip code will not dictate our students' future. They will dictate our own future. Looks like my slide presentation didn't kick in, so I'm gonna work on that. 
Uh, I think, uh, Donna, do you have an email address of Dr. Ganesh Mani? I have sent mine and he's going to run mine. So maybe he can run from your uh, his computer, your slides. So send the slides to him as a backup plan. For, for, to Ganesh? Ganesh? Yeah, I, I put my um, uh, email address in the chat. Yeah, I was going to interrupt you. I wasn't sure whether you only had text or not. Uh, no, no, I no. I have a whole slide presentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, send, send it to me. And I know um, we're coming up on time. I can stay for a couple of minutes. Uh, but uh, no, great content. Actually, the next talk I'm uh, going to um, at LTI here, it's a faculty candidate, is uh, public interest computing and AI and ethics and so on. You know, so, I, uh, I find this so interesting. Your, your interest in this panel's interest in artificial intelligence. And I really, I mean, I was just watching um, Black Panther walk Wakanda forever. And I saw her say that. And I said, that would be really perfect for my qu quote, because it really, I think, highlights the, the, the pros and the cons. And your talk earlier on ethics and morality when it comes to those technological devices was really to the point. Uh, I thought that was really- Well, that was Roger, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I, I think now I have an overview, but in terms of <clears throat> logistics, uh, and I know people have to run, um, um, Rita, what I'll do is, uh, Rita, your slides and Donna's slides, I can run them. Edith and I will coordinate, uh, one of uh, us will run them. Oh, good. Then, well, Roger, if you want to run, uh, or, uh, or if you want to put the three, uh, yours, Colleen's, uh, Lubna's together and uh, run it, do send it to me. I can be the backup, but I'll have you be the uh, primary uh, for okay, that. Okay, no, that's fine. I'll, I'll liaise with um, yeah, Colleen and, 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 and Lubna. So that, that's absolutely fine. I've sent you them. And they're in your inbox, So, that, but that's just a backup. So it made sense because our three sort of, Kind of form a, a unit. right, right. So that uh, you folks have one PowerPoint is what Colleen was saying, which I agree. Yep. Uh, with me running it, you have to say next and all that, so uh, it becomes uh, whatever, and, and I can be the uh, uh, backup. We'll try to make it a little uh, that's, that's smoother. Fine. And, we'll, we'll um, that organized. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's no problem. Rita, I I just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Sorry, Rita. I, when I heard Lubna speak. I said to myself, oh, Rita, you should make the introduction to Ariana Perlstein, who's going to be working with the UN doing her internship in Istanbul. Oh, OK, we we can uh, talk about it. She is in uh, Turkey. She's, oh, yeah. To yeah, some, yeah, in Istanbul. Yes. And yes. Rita made that connection, so that's great. So it looks like we are ready for uh, CPD. And uh, let's plan uh, uh, end of the April. Uh, another preparatory session for STI, for science and technology. And uh, any last words, uh, Roger? 